Welcome to another episode of At the Table with Patrick Lincioni, where everything we talk about is related to changing the world of work so that more organizations can be more effective and less dysfunctional, and employees can be more fulfilled and less miserable. We're mixing things up today for a special episode because today I'm your host, Cody Thompson, and I have a special guest. I'm joined by Patrick, is it Lincioni or Lincioni? Well, it's actually Lincioni. Thank you for asking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no, a lot of people mess that up, so I just wanted to get I, that I right. I never correct them. It's fine. So the reason we've switched roles today is because today is the day that your new book comes out, The Motive. That's right. And this episode is dedicated to diving into that book. I wanted to sit on in your seat and ask you some questions and let the listeners in on, on this new endeavor. So. All right. Let's do it. This is fun. Great. So this is actually the 12th book that you've written, right? but I've heard you on a number of podcast interviews say that <laughs> this should have been the first book that you've written. Tell me why. If somebody were to ask me, hey, there's these 12 books stacked up on a table, which should I read first? I would say, start with this one. And if I'd understood this, I probably would have written it first because this book, before you get into the how of leadership, which most of my books are about how to build a team, how to build an organization, how to be a leader, you really need to address the why. Like, why would you do that in the first place? And that's mm -hmm. what the motive is about. And pretty much any leader should really be asking themselves that question. Am I doing this for the right reason? Because as it turns out, there's two basic motives and one is, is not the right one. The other one is the right one. And if you haven't figured it out or you're not leaning toward the right one, there's going to be problems. Right. And that's what I love the message of this book. Uh, you know, I joined you when you went to Global Leadership Summit last year. You had just finished the book the week that we went there. Right. And you gave your first speech on it. And and one thing that I thought was so important about what you said is the Global Leadership Summit had a tagline. It said everybody has influence. And you at the very beginning of your talk said something a little controversial <laughs> and said everybody has influence and they probably shouldn't. <laughs> so, so it fits right into what you're talking about here. Tell me a little bit about what you mean. Like those two motives, why are they so important? Because if a person is motivated or drawn toward leadership for the wrong reason, and the wrong reason is because they see it as a reward. Mm -hmm. It's like, this is the result of a lifetime of hard work. And now I finally get to reap that reward. They are going to cause problems for the organization they lead and for the people around them. And a lot of people go into leadership for that reason. Mm -hmm. Whereas if a person is motivated by the burden, the responsibility that to serve others, they're going to be willing to do the things that a leader has to do. And I came to realize that if you're, if you're working with somebody who has the wrong motive, you can't consult to them or coach them into the right one. They really have to decide for themselves. And that's why I think this is the first book somebody should read. I think this might actually be the most important book I've written because without this, nothing else I write about makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So we're going to get into more of the content of the book, but before we do, Tell me about how you got this idea. So I've been at the table group for five years. This is now the second book I've been here for a launch and watching the process unfold has been right. so interesting. I even remember you, when you first started percol percolating on this idea, you brought in a list of like, I think there's like all these omissions that, that some leaders just don't do. And, and, right. it, and it refined itself all the way down to what's in this book now. But what was the impetus for all of this. So I, I remember the actual moment when it all came together, when I was at a conference in Palm Springs, it was a leadership conference and I gave a talk. And then I, I went upstairs as I do at this conference and spent some time with about 20 CEOs where they just asked questions and we, you know, sat around in a suite there and, and talked. And I was with a colleague, Karen, and they were asking me questions. I was giving them advice and a lot of people were writing it down. It was pretty straightforward, but then some of them kept arguing with it. And saying, I wouldn't do that. Why would? Why should you do that? And, and I didn't think it was all that controversial. And it dawned on me there on the way back. I was talking to Karen and I said, you know, if those people aren't leaders for the right reason, none of this stuff I'm telling them is going to make sense. Because why would they follow this advice if they had their job for the wrong motive, if they were doing it for themselves? And there's a lot of leaders out there that are doing it for themselves. And so when you ask them to do something that's hard, they're going to say, why? I didn't take this job to do all those hard things. Right. And that causes huge problems in organizations. Yeah. And, and you said this might be the most important book. I, I love that concept because it's true. The, what you have to do is tie this to the cost, right? Yes. The cost of someone having the wrong motive is not just someone who's selfish and in leadership. What is the actual cost to 
people to a company to humanity as a whole. Right. So, well, to humanity as a whole, if we, if we have people going into leadership for the wrong reasons, one, it's going to discourage the others from doing it. And when you see that everybody that wants to be a CEO or the captain of the team or whatever other role it is of leadership is doing it for self aggrandizement, the right people are going to go, I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. And so that's a, that's a bad thing. And as it's happened in society, young people look at leadership and think, well, I guess that's why you do it. And, and, and many of the most famous leaders in the world are famous precisely because they went into it because they wanted to be famous. Like I'll, I'll compare the CEO of, we always talk about Southwest airlines, right. Gary Kelly. Most people wouldn't know him if he walked in the room because he does not care about being famous. He doesn't put his picture out there. And yet he's the most successful CEO in America. There's so many other CEOs that are running marginally successful technology companies or they're successful, but they haven't really made money yet. And they're on the, every newspaper and people think, well, that's the kind of person I'm supposed to be. Right. And, and that's a terrible thing in society because then the wrong people are migrating toward leadership roles and the, the best people are moving against that. So that's the larger one. Yep. But the cost within an organization of having a leader that's motivated by the wrong thing is that some really critical responsibilities are going to get abdicated or delegated. I mean, like, and the one I like to talk about the most is one of the most important things that the leader of an organization, I don't care if you're a pastor or a, or a principal or the CEO of a company or the head of a department, one of the most important things they have to do and the most distasteful is to have really hard conversations, mm. to confront people around behaviors and other really touchy subjects that if the CEO or the leader doesn't do it, nobody else will. And I have consulted to CEOs in my career who said, I don't want to have that conversation. That's just too messy for me. And I think, but that's your job. Right. And some of them are just like, yeah, but I didn't take this job so I, I could tell people difficult things. I took it because it looked fun and I could cherry pick the activities that I took part in. So when you have an organization where the leader is not having difficult conversations or communicating adequately to people or building their team, and there's a, there's a list of things that yep. they don't do. If no, nobody else is going to do it, it's going to leave that organization suffering and real human beings are going to leave work far worse off than if the leader did their job. Yeah, that's that's the point that you kept making at GLS that just resonated with me so much as you just kept saying real people suffer. It's not about company success and the bottom line and the stock price. It's that when you have leaders that don't have the right motive, real human beings suffer. They go home to their family, a different person. They lose sleep over this. And yeah. so the cost here is so high. This is an incredibly important book and, and one that I hope has the desired outcome that, that, that you wrote it for. So a leader can know all the right things to do, but if they don't really want to do the hard things, they're going to cherry pick those. Mm -hmm. and, and so I can't emphasize enough. You have to start with, am I really doing this for the right reason? And, and it's not black and white. It's not like people are born into this, like I have the right reason right. or the wrong reason. In fact, many of us can relate to times in our life, I've done it, where I've slid. Like I was motivated by the right thing and then I kind of started getting like, well, I'd kind of like to have more fun. And it's like, well, then do something else because <laughs> if your job requires you to do things that are unfun, you have to do it. So this isn't a matter of people are in one or the other. It's like, assess yourself. We had one of the CEOs whose quote we put on the back of the book the Veridesk CEO. What? What did you? Yeah, have I was, was going to get to that. So one of the I love all the yeah the, I endorsements love these, on the they're back. All real. But he, Jason McCann, the CEO of Veridesk, said the motive rocked me to my core. A gift for any aspiring CEO or current one. And I love this part. I wish Pat Lincioni had written this thirty years ago. And I so appreciate that because he said it rocked me to my core. Because all of us have to look at this and say oh my gosh, I think sometimes my motive slips. Yeah. And so this isn't about good leader or bad leader. It's about if you can't embrace the right motive, please do not be a leader. Mm. Which is why when I go to college graduations and people stand up, the speaker says, everybody go out there and be a leader. I want to stand up and yell, no. Because <laughs> if you don't want to do it for the right reasons, and most 21-year-olds don't, you should be not looking for a leadership role. You should be figuring out who you are. Yeah, and so... I love you've made the case for the two the two different motives, right? And that's what that's the premise of the book. But then you this fiction. So I don't know how many how many of our 
listeners have read your book, but I'm sure uh, many of them have any of your books, all except for one. Wait, um, are all written, of my books, but, are, but one are fiction. Yeah. And, and the story is so compelling in this one in particular. And just it's, it's fun to have been here for now two of them, but this one was so unique as you were writing. I got to read it as chunks were coming out Yeah, and there were these twists and turns that I just thought, Oh man, I don't know how you, how you came up with this, but this one in particular is a day long conversation between two CEOs. This is a short book. I, I mean, I've probably read it now eight or nine times throughout right. the, the process, <laughs> which I but, appreciate very much. Yeah. <laughs> but you really get through it so quickly and it's a page turner. This fiction with this conversation is a one day sort of start to finish about who has the right motive and who doesn't. Right. And I think that's the, the one of the things I never like to encourage people to read my books because it sounds self-centered. And I always think maybe this one sucks. <laughs> but I think the things I would say about this book that I like are that people have read it said the fiction was really like it kept them on the edge of their seat. And there was a lot of good conflict and twists and turns and it's short. Mm -hmm. And, and I will just tell people that the publisher said, I think it needs to be a long, little longer. And I was like, well, that's all that I have because right. <laughs> the story is what it is. So when a book is short and it's, it's engaging, I think it's a compelling read. Yeah. And, and, I, and most people said they think that this one is maybe the most compelling fiction I've written yet. Well, rather than, I had an excerpt that I would thought about reading, but I'm just going to conceptualize it and ask you a question. So okay. there was one scene between the two CEOs where one of the CEOs that's mo that has the right motive for leading says, redefines what chief executive officer means. And right. you say that it's chief executing officer. Right. Tell me about that. Well, the, the point is the, the job is not a noun, it's a verb. So when people say, I'm the chief executive officer, I'm the leader, it's like, no, you're the leading person. You're the person who leads. Mm -hmm. you're executing is a, I think it's a participle, and, and which means it's actually something you do. Whereas chief executive officer sounds like you're just fulfilling a role. And so what I like to say is, well, you say that you're the chief executive officer, but are you doing this and this and this and this and this? There's five things we go through in the book that poorly motivated CEOs don't do. Mm -hmm. If you're not doing those things, you're not the chief executing officer. And so we, we like to think that people, when they go into leadership, should say, I want to do the verb part. I don't want the, just the title. Right. Well, let's get into those five things because this is where leaders can actually assess, right? Like that's sort of the, right. the goal of this whole book is you lay out this case for five things that reward-centered leaders abdicate right. or they don't do at, for the sake of people identifying in themselves, do I have the right motive or not? Right. So, so tell, yeah, you already mentioned one. Yeah, we'll go through them quickly. So, and, and these are not the five roles of a CEO or a leader. They're the five things that all or many of them often get abdicated by people who aren't doing it for the right reason. The first one is what we said before is having difficult conversations. I don't know how many times I've had leaders, CEOs say, I don't have the time and the energy to have that difficult conversation. Hmm. I don't want to confront that people. It's usually about awkward behavioral issues that somebody has to confront one of their direct reports or somebody else in the organization or a vendor or a customer. It's like, if you're not willing to step up and have that conversation, nobody else probably is. Right. And so that's one of the things CEO said, I didn't take this job so I could have uncomfortable conversations. It's like, well, you needed to. And that one, you had some incredibly colorful stories to help illustrate, but there was one other piece that you said around that, that about bad personal economics. Right. Tell me about that. Right. We tend to think, well, if I can avoid this conversation right now and my day will be better, mm -hmm. but that's going to push the problem out and make it get much bigger for the next weeks and months and longer. And so, to, so often we trade off our comfort level in the, in, in the moment and we create a much bigger problem that we cannot really run from. And somebody's going to get fired and it might be the CEO or, or a lot of damage is going to be done in the organization because our personal economics were just unwise hmm. and selfish. Yeah. Okay. So not having difficult conversations. Yeah. Another one is running great meetings. And, and we've talked about meetings before, but a lot of leaders will go, I'm the CEO or I'm the, or I'm the pastor or I'm the principal or whatever else I run the organization. And yeah, lead, meetings kind of suck. And so I'm going to go to as few of them as I can. Yeah. And when I go to the ones I have, I'm going to get as much out of them personally as I can. But if people find them boring, that's fine. It's this is my job to get what I need to get out of them. And the answer is this. If you're the leader, you have to make those meetings compelling and focused and drive to closure and exhausting. Your job is to make those meetings great. And if you don't feel the burden of doing that, and you feel like you could just walk away from that or delegate it to your chief of staff, you're not doing your job. Yeah. I love the bit you do. Not that you're a comedian or anything like that, but the bit you do on 
wh- how would you evaluate a leader other than meetings? Like you, you, you know, it, right. you, you end up saying, how would you evaluate a teacher in the classroom? Right. How would you evaluate a surgeon doing surgery? Right. You know, and, and so many, and how would you evaluate a leader? And it's during meetings. Well, and this actually speaks to something, Cody, that I think is interesting. If you were to ask most people who have never worked in the world of business or a young person, you'd say, what do CEOs do? And they'd say, they give speeches and they go on TV and right. get interviewed, which is about 0.01% of their job. What they do is they go to meetings and they have conversations and they, and they, and they pour through issues. And so when a CEO or a leader says, I don't like meetings, it's like, that is your job. Right. Go be a newscaster if you want to be on TV. <laughs> But And yet most people say, I want to be a leader because they see a very small part of the job and they think it sounds glorified when in fact, most of the work is just hard. Mm. So meetings are the second thing. Second the, one. the third thing would be actually taking responsibility for building a team. And, I, and, and that doesn't mean abdicating team building to the head of HR or to some consultant. It means, and it doesn't mean going out in the woods and catching each other falling out of a tree or something ridiculous like that. It's like, I am going to invest my time and energy in prioritizing getting these group of people who work for me. Again, if you're the principal, it's the vice principals, or if it's the pastor, it's the people that work for you. If it's the CEO, it's your direct reports. I have to get these people to work well together, and I'm going to invest my time and energy in making that happen. And that means we're going to get together in a room. We're going to think about how we, this fits together. And we're going to have really uncomfortable group conversations. Mm-hmm. So many CEOs go, yeah, I'm not really into that. I'm going to just fly them to Aruba to go scuba diving, or <laughs> we're going to go golfing every Thursday. Right. That's not what we're talking about here. And a lot of leaders just aren't interested in doing this. They know it's going to be uncomfortable. It might not be their sweet spot. And then it leaves the team dysfunctional. Right. It's got real costs, real human beings suffer if right. you don't pay attention to that as a leader. Okay. So three, what's the fourth? The fourth one is actually managing your direct reports as individuals. Now, and I have to say, this is, this is the one I fall down on because sometimes you get to the point you're like, well, I hire people I trust and they're adults and they know what they need to do. And for me, it's like, oh, it's kind of tedious to actually go, what are you working on and how's it going? And, and give them feedback. I like the feedback part, but I don't really like the tracking on the details. But the thing is, if the CEO or the leader of an organization doesn't know what people are working on and doesn't know where progress stands, what else is right. going to happen? Somebody else is going to have to do that. And nobody really has the, the responsibility for that other than the, the, the leader. And so what we say is, even if you find it tedious, even that's not what your personality is, that is your job. So do not abdicate. And usually they do that leadership and say, well, I don't want to be a micromanager. Right. No, that's the, the, the part of micromanagement in the book I thought was fantastic. Right. It's like that word that people use. CEOs use it because they're off. Sometimes they're lazy. I've done that. And people that work for you say, don't micromanage me. That's just another way of saying, please don't hold me accountable. Mm -hmm. And the truth is if micromanagement is knowing what your people are working on and tracking their progress and and coaching them when they need help, then please be a micromanager. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Maybe micromanagement has been underestimated. The importance that could be a of new it. undergraduate course. Course, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Micromanagement for <laughs> yeah. beginners. The last and the fifth thing that we see so many leaders abdicate, and that is what we call being the CRO of an organization, the chief reminding officer. They don't over communicate. A lot of leaders like to give a speech at the beginning of the year and and send out a note to their employees, and then they say, "Okay, let's move on to the next thing." That's where we get this flavor of the month thing. The truth of the matter is, if you're the leader of an organization of any kind, you have to constantly repeat yourself, constantly remind people, and that's your job. And if that doesn't seem sexy or interesting or entertaining to you, that's okay, because your job isn't to entertain yourself, it's to make sure people are on the right track. And the best leaders in the world, we've talked about this before, are constantly reminding their employees, and they're not moving on to the other subjects because they're bored. And so a lot of leaders will go, I don't want to repeat myself, I feel stupid, I don't want to manage my people as individuals. I've done that for years. I'm kind of done with that. I don't want to do these offsites where we get into one another's feelings and figure out how we're going to work together. I don't want to have to have good meetings. I'd rather just have less of them and not go to very many. And finally, I don't want to have difficult, uncomfortable conversations because frankly, I don't think I should have to. Mm -hmm. An organization where those activities are abdicated cannot come close to maximizing its success and probably is going to fail And at the end of the day, and I've seen this from soup to nuts, you're going to go back and realize the CEO took the job for the wrong reason. Mm. That's why it's so important for every person to ask themselves why. I mean, you have to get that sorted out before you get into, and it's not just 
the CEO, but anytime you're running a group of individuals at any level in the organization, if you're doing it for the wrong reasons, real people suffer. Yeah. And, and so what you've done is you've laid out these five things, not like you said, they're not the fi- list of five things that good leaders do and bad leaders don't. It's a list of things that people who are reading this can look at and say, do I do any of these? And if I, if I abdicate any of them, why? You know, I was talking to the head coach of an NFL team the other day, and he didn't actually want to be a head coach. He didn't want to be a coach. He was going to go take a job after he retired. And, and one of the legendary coaches said to him, you would be a fantastic coach. You really should do this because the game needs more people like you. Mm. And he does all the uncomfortable things. He said, I have to do those things. That's my job. Right. Whereas there's other coaches that are like, I want to be on TV and I want to be famous in the city where I live. I don't want to have to do all this other stuff. Right. And it, it and that translates to wins and losses on the field. It translates to the experience of people that work there, whether they're on the field or whether they work in marketing or whatever else. We have to make sure if you're hiring people to, for, to be leaders, find out if they really want to do the job to serve others or if they want to do the, have the job to serve themselves. Yeah, that's great. Well, one of the things that you said earlier, which, is, which we have to get back to is that you're not born one way or the other, that, that people slide throughout the, their, their careers what advice would you give to someone after they read this book or they listen to this podcast and they say, I think my motive might be off. Where do you even begin to start? Well, I would say, ask yourself this. Are you comfortable acknowledging that you have the hardest job in the company? And I, I mean that really, like that you're doing the most uncomfortable things. And if you feel like you should have the most fun job in the company and that you have finally, you get to choose what you work on, that's just not the case. Mm-hmm. It's just like a parent saying, I want to be a parent. But man, changing diapers, getting up in the middle of the night, having to listen to their problems, um, <laughs> bailing them out of jail someday. Hopefully none of us have to do that. You're signing up for all of that. And if you're going into a leadership role and you're saying to yourself, man, I hope I never have to do those things, then it's time to take another look. And many leaders can, can do a gut check and, and, and change. But if you just realize, no, this really is about me, please do a favor to the people that you're leading in your organization and, and step down and let somebody do the job who wants to mm. and who is ready to take that on. Yeah. I love that. In the book, you talk about your people kind of already know, you know, like if, oh. if, if you're leading for the wrong reasons, it's very likely that the people under you already know they see it. And the best move you can make is just to go in, be vulnerable and say, Hey, I'm so sorry. I've been, I've, I've kind of had my own self-interest of, in mind here. Yeah. I'm going to try to change and I need you guys to help me. Right. I mean, like, and, and sometimes it's like, hey, I haven't been doing this one thing because I don't think it's fun. And I thought I had the right to pick and choose what I worked on. I need to start doing this thing because it's my job. And I'm sorry that I've let you down. Hmm. I mean, that's a winner right there. People are going to be like, I, we knew that. You know it now. You've just gained our trust. Great. Well, I'm going to read one other endorsement here on the back from Dan Bigman, Chief Executive Magazine. He says, Pat Lincioni blows up the myth that anyone with ambition can and should become a leader. And mm. I, I love that because that is the message. That's the graduation speech. That's what everyone tells their kids, go out and lead. And more and more people need to hear, not everyone should be a leader. You end the book. This is my favorite part. In fact, as you finish the section and gave it to Tracy and I, I kind of got chills reading it. You said it, the, the title of the section is called the end of servant leadership. Oh, yeah. Tell me about, I, I mean, this, this concept I think is so important. And if people just got this, it would drastically change the makeup of like who becomes leaders, who we idolize as leaders, right. all of that. Right. So people talk about servant leadership a lot, and that really comes from Jesus. You know, I'm a follower of Jesus, I'm a Christian. And so people say, oh, that guy's great. He's a servant leader or she's a servant leader. And I think, you know, I really wish people would quit saying that. And, and they're like, why? And I'm like, because to call someone a servant leader implies that there's another way to do it that's valid. <laughs> so I do love when people say that, but wouldn't it be great if one day people said they're a leader? Of course they're a servant leader because that's the whole point. Mm-hmm. They're here for, because it's a burden and a responsibility and they're willing to take that on. So we would never use that term because we wouldn't need to. Yeah. No, this is such an important message. And, and I do think that the impact of this book it can be huge. I mean, I, I loved being a part of this process. I love that all the people who've read it so far are just thrilled with 
what it did for them and how it's going to shape leadership. But I want to say thanks for coming on the show. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank uh, you for having me. But I thought at the end, I just want to encourage people. So this book is out. It's on Amazon. It's called The Motive. Right the subtitle now, it is, just got released. Yeah. Why so many leaders abdicate their most important responsibilities. Go out, get the book. You're also... If you want to. If you yeah, want to. If you want to. And also, you are doing a speech on this in March 5th right. at our conference. And we are live streaming the speech. So... In in more depth and in more stories that help illustrate these points, you're going to do a keynote, 30 minutes. People can go to our website, www.tablegroup.com and sign up for that live stream. And it's free. It's free. But if you sign up now, it's 50% off. Yeah, right. <laughs> free 99. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Thanks for having me here. And let's just say to everybody, God bless. God bless.